Hey guys, happy Wednesday. I know this video is way later than I thought it was going to be because I honestly did not think it was going to take me this long to do all the pictures, but to get all the pictures all nice and, you know, together, it takes a long time. So I just didn't think it would take me three hours, but it did. So, but you got them all the same size now with a border. So tonight, everybody has asked me for about a month already, please do Richard Kuklinski, the Iceman. And I knew the story, obviously I grew up in New York, but I didn't, I didn't think so many people were interested in him. I mean, it's a great story and his, he's got a great history, but the misconception about him is that he was a serial killer. He was not a serial killer. He killed a lot of people, but he was not a serial killer. He was a mafia hitman. It's a big difference. Serial killers kill whoever for no reason. Um, for, you know, sexual reasons or different reasons. Richard did not kill anybody for sexual reasons. Richard was the perfect hitman. And he did things differently than so many other people. But before I get into him, I have to give you a little background on the mafia. A lot of people think the mafia is what they see in GTA 5, Grand Theft Auto 5. Or um, they think the mafia is, you know, a bunch of Italian uh, gurus, guidos. I couldn't think of the word. Guidos, you know, walking around, yo, bro, what's up? Or, you know, how you doing? That's what people think of when they think of the mafia. Or they think of the Sopranos or Godfather. Sopranos is based on New York City Mafia. That's why it was placed in Jersey and the way they acted. But some of the things that the Sopranos left out was the core rules of the Mafia. Now, there's five Mafia... I mean, there's Mafia families all over the world. But the five that I'm familiar with are the ones that I grew up with. And that was the five in New York City. Now, understand, too, growing up in New York... Everybody knew a Gambino. Everybody knew a Bonanno. Everybody knew a um, Lucchese. Everybody knew a Genovese. It, these were names that were synonymous with New York City. So if you lived in any of the five boroughs, which is Queens, Staten Island, Manhattan, um, <laughs> uh, Queens, Staten Island, Manhattan, Bronx, Brooklyn. I can't believe I forgot Bronx and Brooklyn. You know, either your parents grew up in the Bronx or Brooklyn and then they moved out to Queens or they moved out to Long Island. It's still like that today. So those are the five families. And I went to high school with a bunch of them. You know, it's I went one that I was very close with was a Gambino who was never allowed to meet his grandfather. I mean, that's how it was then. Didn't matter. His dad owned a construction company in Long Island. It was kind of obvious, but he was never allowed to meet his grandfather. So. You know, but you just, you knew that they were connected. Some of them were, some of them weren't, but ancestral wise, they were, you know, they could date back to the family. So it was very interesting growing up in the eighties in New York. Now I know the mafia has been around since the twenties, but in the eighties, you know, there weren't like street gangs. It was the mafia and you stayed the fuck away from them. You know, you, I was in a job in the city, um, in my twenties and thirties where the mob hung out a lot. And I worked at a club where the mob hung out a lot and you just kind of stayed away. Even in Vegas, when I was working in Vegas at the clubs I was in in Vegas, the mob owned them. And you know, it was, it was just very weird. Like it, they told you what to do. You did it. Like you didn't think twice. So be without getting into too much of that, um, cause now you guys are going to ask me what I did, but the mafia has rules. A lot of people think they don't, they do. They have some serious rules too, that you do not break or you will be killed. Um, there's like eight specific rules. One of them is no facial hair. You will never see a true mob, a mobster with any kind of facial hair. They didn't like it. It was just, clean shaven, um, only no mustache, no beard, no nothing. Adultery. You can totally sleep with whoever you want and you can pick up any stripper. You could pick up anyone at the supermarket as long as it wasn't another member's wife. 
or daughter. That was a no-no. You could be killed for that. That broke the code of the mafia. I am every month they had a party, which to me, they just want an excuse to party boys night, but you had a tribute to the Godfather. So like John Gotti, who was pretty much, you know, ran it when I was young, um, all the years I can remember, John Gotti was the Godfather and, you know, every month they would go somewhere and they would have a tribute to him cause he's so wonderful. Don't ask. Um, another thing that's highly against is no fighting amongst members. You are not allowed to fight with members of your own family. doesn't matter what they did. Blood for blood. Um, let's say somebody kills your wife. Somebody kills somebody in your family, your uncle. Let's say your uncle pissed somebody off and somebody shot him. You are not allowed to get revenge on him unless the boss says so. And I mean, you had to stick with this. This may sound like, you know, oh, how lame, but you had to stick with it. Like, or you were going to end up dead. I personally could not imagine living the life where every time I looked over my shoulder, I had no idea what was going to happen. Hell no. Um, family secrets. You are not allowed to talk about family business to non-members, which to me is kind of a given like, yo, I just shot somebody. Yeah, sure you did. You know, like. You don't want to talk to people about it. And your wives and kids were not part of your family. I mean, they were your real family, but as far as your mafia family, they didn't know anything. Um, they, they turned the other way. Most wives knew, but just kind of look the other way. But kids, kids had no clue for the most part. Boys may have, daughters didn't. Um, eth uh, ethnic background. Your father, you didn't have to be 100% Italian, although most in New York City are. Um, a lot of Sicilian, Napoli Dons, you, your mom didn't matter if she came from Italy or not. Your father had to come from Italy. Um, and he really had to have his lineage in order to be full members. You, your dad had to be full blooded Italian. Then they had the Omerta, which is the code of silence. Don't be a rat. It's essentially what took the mafia down in the end was Sammy the Bull turned on um, John Gotti, and it went from there. The Mafia today is not what it used to be at all. Um, the Mafia today will never be what it used to be. They could never bring it back. There's too much shit that's gone on um, with the mob, with John Gotti going down. Like, understand what the mob, they used to buy their way out of any kind of jail sentence, any prison sentence. Oh, not guilty. They bought off judges. But New York City was like that. It, it's not like it is now. Like, it wasn't hard to buy off a judge, you know? And <clears throat> they were the mob. They were the mob, you know? And the reason why judges did it, not because they were assholes, they did it because they got protection. I would not want to be the judge that threw a boss man or the godfather in jail knowing that 10 other people are still out. You know, they had no couth when it came to, you know, protecting their members. And it got really bad in the nineties in the late nineties, two thousands. Um, and then, got, you know, once Gotti got popped, his son took over, he ended up dying. A lot of them ended up dying. Um, I know well, John Gotti Jr. didn't die, but another family I was thinking of did, um, you know, they wanted to follow their dad's footsteps and they ended up being dead. So it's just crazy. It was a crazy time to grow up. It was a crazy life. Um, but I mean, even as far as 2000 in, when did I leave Vegas? 2003. Yeah. Cause I became pregnant with my twins. Mob was still running Vegas clubs. They were still running Vegas. It wasn't the same, but they were still running Vegas. So this brings me to Richard Kuklinski who was actually Polish and not Irish. So you're thinking after everything I just said, how did a Polish guy end up, you know, such a mafia hitman? There's a long story behind it. And in order to really understand Kuklinski, I kind of have to give you a background. Now, Kuklinski never hit a woman, never killed a woman, never touched a child. As most uh, mobsters, people thought that he was this wonderful family man. His wife had no idea. 
his kids had no idea. They just thought daddy had a lot of money. And that was his downfall was money. Kuklinski liked having money and being six foot five, 240 pounds. He was not somebody you'd want to meet in an alley. But, you know, he didn't just like go up to you and shoot you in the head. Like he was way smarter than that. He put cyanide in people's burgers to watch them suffer. Think about that. You're just out with your buddy. You're eating a burger. He orders a burger. He's like, hey, eat up. Here you go. He put cyanide in it. He would literally watch them foam and watch everything come out of them all at the same time. That is so sick. Um, but his downfall, he actually got caught because he got sloppy when he was nearing 50, he completely got sloppy and it's how he got caught. It's ultimately how he got caught. He was talking to a non-member who he thought was a member of another crime family, I guess. And cause I can't imagine why he was talking, you know, even openly about the cyanide and it, the guy who happened to be an undercover cop. So this undercover cop was getting all this information. He's laughing along with him, but Richard was going to kill him. That's why he was telling him all this information. I mean, like, that's just how he did things. Like, he just thought it was totally awesome, you know? Like, ah, let me, I'm going to get you to trust me, this and that, and I'm going to blow your fucking head off. So the other way he got busted was his most famous crime. And that's, oh, I like the burger murders right here. Um, his famous crime was he didn't just kill people and like leave them in the street, like normal mobsters. No, he was smart. He froze them. The six victims that he had, he literally froze them. And then he would put them on the street and they would find them. And his biggest one was his ultimate demise because the coroner said, this guy's got a frozen heart. How the fuck is his heart frozen? So the way Glincy beat, you know, time was he would freeze these bodies and then throw them later. So coroners would think, you know, he used to do it when he was smart, but coroners used to think that these bodies were fresh and it couldn't have been, you know, it was somebody else. But that's why he got named the Iceman. That's where the name the Iceman came from is because he froze victims and then threw them out a couple of years later. So it looked like they were missing when they actually weren't. So he's probably thinking at this point, well, you know, okay, so he doesn't sound that bad. Or, you know, that doesn't sound that insane. The guy was fucking crazy. He was very smart, but he was insane. So, like, his neighbors and stuff, he was the all-American man. He was very respectful. He had no problem, you know, helping a neighbor. He, he was just a great guy. Um, he never liked to use the word assassin because when you called an assassin, he, uh, he like thought it sounded exotic and in his own mind, it was too exotic for him. He was just a murderer. That's what he says. I was not an assassin. I wasn't a sniper. I was just a murderer. Um, he claims that he killed over 300 people, but he actually only got sentenced for six. Um, and it, you know, being a mob hitman, it's kind of obvious that I'm sure he killed more than six people over the course of what, 10, 15, 20 years. <coughs> But he, there was no way to prove it. You know, how are you going to prove that these people died? But what he did do was he actually said in court, he announced, you know, the day he killed them. So, I mean, it gave him a lot of credibility when they found out, you know, that the dates match the bodies. Um, But he liked killing. Like he wasn't one of these guys that, just didn't like killing. He actually enjoyed it. Um, he was born on August 11th, uh, April 11th of 1935 in Jersey city. The problem with his family was his dad was so abusive, like to the point that Richard's big secret in life was that his dad killed his own brother. 
beat him to death, like seriously beat him to death. And Richard watched this kind of abuse. He watched his mom take this kind of abuse. He just, he, it was normal for him. But as he got bigger, like he had his own aggressions, you know, he didn't know how to deal with what he was growing up in. He got kicked out of the, um, school in the eighth grade for killing neighborhood cats. So what does that tell you? Um, and he dropped out of school. He couldn't be bothered. Supposedly he was never caught, but supposedly committed his first murder when he was 14. And this was what gave him the taste for killing. And he, he actually thought he was going to get caught. He was convinced he was going to get caught. He like hid the murder weapon and everything. And some guy was bullying him at school or right after school. And he finally had enough. So he decided, you know what? I'm going to beat this guy. I'm going to get him. I'm going to beat him at his own game. And I'm going to make sure that he never fucks with me again. So he waited outside for him, like on, you know, like a side now, I don't know how it is now in school, but if you were Polish in the 80s in Jersey and New York, you got made fun of. I know it's horrible, but you did. Um, everybody made fun of them. So that's what this bully was doing. He kept making fun of him. And Richard waited around the corner for him and took, a, I think it was a rock or a stick. I don't remember exactly, but he beat this guy to death, like literally to death. He kind of covered him up and the guy was found. There was a big thing. Richard was sure he was going to get busted. Never got caught. He's like, you know what? Now I know how to handle people. I'm just going to kill them. But between the abuse from his father that he endured, watching his brother die from the hands of his father, it, it to me, it's kind of obvious you're going to grow up to be a serial killer, but whatever. Um... He grew up to, I thought he was 240. He was actually 6'5 and 300 pounds. Um, in the 50s, he got involved with the mafia. Initially, he stifled them because they'd relegate him on lesser crimes. So he fulfilled his own personal lust for murder on the side. Now, how he even got involved with the mafia was he, I, he was working for, it's an interesting story, but he was working for this company where they put out movies and stuff and it was like kids movies and one night after work he realized that you know what what are they doing like why does everything change at night and he realized they were making porn movies so one of his co-workers was like oh you know for sixty five thousand dollars i can get you involved in this porn movie business you know where you sell porn and you can make money so he what he didn't know is that his friend was borrowing money from um, DeMeo, which who was very high up in the Gambino crime family. So you didn't fuck with DeMeo. If you owe DeMeo money, you paid DeMeo and Richard didn't pay him. He didn't have the money. So DeMeo came and kicked his ass and Richard within like one week got all $65,000 and he took a beating like a man. So DeMeo was like, you know what? This guy could be worth something to me. Let me, let me take him, you know, let's bring him on and see what he can do. So at first, you know, they were giving him bullshit stuff and then they decided, you know what? Let's see, let's see what he can do because, uh, um, what's his name? The Iceman proved that, Hey, I can murder. No problem. I can, I can follow your stupid rules of the mafia. So in 54, 1954, Iceman would make periodic trips from New Jersey to New York City, prowling the streets for people to kill. Like literally, it's all he did. Um, it could be someone he sought out or just a random person who annoyed him just a little. Like he had this instinct, I have to kill. Methods of killing were just as random um, as some victims he would shoot, others he would stab, he would bludgeon with a stick. Um, his weapon of choice was solely based on, um, his mood. He's killed people with ice picks. He's killed people with hand grenades. Like he's blown up people with hand grenades, putting it in the mouth. Um, he's also put, taken cyanide and put it in nasal spray bottles and sprayed it to people. 
So his reputation eventually spread to the elite of the organized crime world, particularly notorious. Um, the Gambino crime felon who hired him as the first major gang killing. He also became associated with um, DeMeo even more. And Kalinske would, you know, keep doing stuff for DeMeo and other members of the Gambinos. Now, because his father was an Italian, he couldn't be a full-blooded member, but he could certainly be a hitman. And even other members of the Gambino crime family literally called him the devil himself. Um, he was the type of killer that he took whatever steps it took not to get caught. Like, he did not want to get caught. And... It just didn't matter to him. Like nothing. He had no conscience at all. If you want to talk about the ultimate, ultimate psychopath, it was him to a T. Um, his family had no idea what was going on. Um, in 61, he married Barbara. She didn't know by the time they met that he had allegedly already committed like 65 murders they had three children together and everyone that knew them, they were the all American family. Um, he ended up putting his kids in private, uh, private schools, just like most mob, you know, mob kids did mob parents did. They put their kids in private schools cause you know, they belonged to an elite crew and they had the money to pay for it. He took his kids to church every single Sunday and when the police ended up catching him, finally, they surrounded him. Barbara, his wife, had no clue what was going on. She's like, did he jaywalk? You know, like, what What could possibly be the reason? So he used to get really, really angry at his wife. And she says that he'd hit her a couple of times. Um, He says that he used to get angry and it was doable. She says it was so beyond angry that she just became oblivious to the extreme criminal life he led on the side. Now she may not have seen it, but throughout their marriage, Iceman continued to murder. He was kept in constant employment by the families of the Italian mafia. Whoever owned the mob money or insulted them or just became a nuance, he took care of it. Uh, but unlike other members, he wasn't prone to drinking or gambling. Uh, despite admission that he had killed hundreds of people, he said he would never murder women or children. Most notably, he was able to keep up the family man facade by thoroughly compartmentalizing his life. He didn't tell members of organized crime anything about his personal life, his family or where he lived. He looked at them like employers. He never socialized with them outside of work. Um, and for a quantified psychopath, he had random recollections of specific moments. Like in one case, after he was caught, he spoke of a man that he was about to kill who was begging and praying for him not to. Now, it, this is a really interesting story. He told this guy, this guy's like praying, you know, God, please save me, please save me. So Kuklinski said, I will give you 30 minutes for God to come save you. And if God can save you within 30 minutes, I will spare your life. Well, 30 minutes came and went. Nobody, God never came down and saved him. And Kuklinski shot him in the back of the head and he was dead. But, you know, I don't know what he expected to happen. As you guys know, I'm an atheist. So I found that story pretty funny because what's God going to do? Um, if there even is a God, what's he going to do? So I thought that was pretty funny. Um, it's a good story. So God never showed up and never changed the circumstances. Cause that's what it was. He had to like change the circumstances. So by the eighties, it's already been 25 years that he's been working as a hitman for the mafia. And he started his own crime ring. Then there was a trail of mistakes that ultimately led to his arrest and not never really understanding why he did it. But I, you get lazy, you get, you know, you don't care anymore. So the biggest mistake that led to his undoing was Phil Salamine, 
He was a local mafia man at the closest thing Kuklinski had to a friend. Salamine helped in a sting operation during which he recorded a conversation with Kuklinski about a conspiracy to kill. The manhunt operation that began in 85 concluded in 86, and on that day, the unmarked cars had surrounded Richard from Barbara. The cops pointed guns at their heads. Cops were on their way to breakfast. Um, the couple was on their way to breakfast. Pat Kane, who was the lead investigator, approached Barbara in the midst of her confusion over what happened and just said, he's a murderer. He was charged with five murders the following day and in 1988 was found guilty of four of them. He was later convicted on two more and given two consecutive life sentences. Um, Pat Kane believed that he killed as many as 300 men saying that, you know, he killed who he wanted whenever he wanted before, after his arrest, it became evident that his love of being in the public eye was on par with his love for killing. He gave interviews to prosecutors, psychiatrists, reporters, criminologists, the newscasters. Um, he's, um, he participated in two documentaries about his life and spoke candidly on the things about why he claims now he claims to have killed Jimmy Hoffa for which he was paid $40,000. Nobody knows who killed Jimmy Hoffa. Anybody can claim they killed Jimmy Hoffa and buried him somewhere. It's he's the longest known, um, murdered mafia person that has never been found. Bones have never been found. TV interview done from prison. He said, I've never felt sorry for anything I've done. But then he says, other than hurting my family, I do want my family to forgive me. After 25 years in prison, his health started deteriorating. He, in 2005, he was diagnosed incurable inflammation, inflammation of the blood vessels. Kuklinski was eventually transferred to the hospital where Barbara would go and see him one last time. In and out of consciousness, in a moment of wake, he asked doctors to revive him if he should flatline. However, on a way out, Barbara signed a do not resuscitate form. A week before he died, they called her to see if she had changed her mind. She hadn't. Richard Kuklinski died on March 5th, 2006. And, you know, it makes you interested. What makes that interesting is all the people he killed, he was so afraid to go to hell. And, you know, he he believed in church. He believed in God. And it, it's a very sad way to end your life. And it's even sadder that his wife would not save him. Um, I, I don't, I know a lot of people like, how could you feel bad for him? It's not that I feel bad for him because in his mind, what he did through his life was right. So if there is a heaven and a hell, I don't think he's going to hell just because he killed because he believed that he was doing the right thing and he would never hurt a family member. And, you know, he would never kill a woman or child. So that's what I have on the Iceman, Richard Kuklinski. And again, I'm sorry this video is going out so late, but better late than never. Um, and I so look forward to Friday night. We're going to talk way more about the mafia and Richard Kuklinski, and it's going to be live. Last I knew, Mass Cobra was doing it with me. I don't know if he is still. I haven't spoke to him, but I think he is. So we will see you guys Friday night. Um, it's going to be a long live because it's my birthday, so don't forget my birthday party. Uh, but there's literally so much information on Kuklinski. I could go on for hours upon hours upon hours. So I hope you guys like this video. Don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to become a Patreon. We are now up to 10 Patreons. Um, and I forgot to pull the list, so I'm sorry, but I will get the list tomorrow. Um, and I hope you guys have a fantastic night and I don't know why it's like flashing behind me. I keep seeing it out of the corner of my eye. So I'll see you guys tomorrow. I may do another video tomorrow. I'm not sure. Or I'll see you guys Friday for my birthday. All right. So have a wonderful night and I'll see you guys tomorrow. Peace out.